Welcome back, Nick Lenz. It's Comic Corner Classic. That's non classic. This is episode number nine, uh, 1065 and double set number 959. I got two DC trades. First up, it is Teen Titans Silver Age Volume 2, which collects issues 12 to 24 of the series. Plus, and I kid you not, the book doesn't even list this at all for some reason. Yes. And yet, in the table of contents, it's listed here. But not in well, actually, it's listed on the um, on this page here on the copyright page listed here, but not listed back the book. The book also includes Brave and Bold sixty three. Yep, book has got several different writers on it. First, it's Bob Haney, who's the guy who actually started the series. He basically write he, he basically leaves after issue number seventeen, and then starting with issue eighteen becomes simply written by. We have Lean Wee and Marv Wolfman does issue 18. 19 is done by Mike Frederick. 20 is done by Neil Adams, also draws the issue. Bob Haney comes back for issue for the 83 for being bold. 21 is also done by Neil Adams. And 22, uh, backup story in the book is done by Marv Wolfman. Bob Haney comes back for 23 and 24. Yep. These are the artists who basically do all these issues. Now, mostly it is just Bob Haney. Now, it just basically lists all the writers. Here are the artists here. Nick Cardi, who does pretty much all the covers, and he does, I believe he does his cover as well. Actually, it's Nick. This cover is of Nick Derringen. The RRs are Arvin Nurk, Lee Ellis, of course, New Adams, the Lake Gil Kane, Wally Wood, and Bill Durat. Now, in these stories, it's simply put, well, the original. It starts off uh, first off with the original five, which original four when the series starts off with, which is basically Robin, Wonder Girl, Aqualad, and Kid Flash. It's like that for the first two issues, and then with issue eighteen, we have our we have well, Speedy join the team. Yeah, I'm used to calling him Arsenal because he's technically been called Arsenal. You've heard him Arsenal. Back in 2010, of all things, yes. He's been technically called that, well, now for nine years. After he'd been previously known as Red Arrow since 2006. So, that's been four years as the Red Arrow. He simply returned to his Arsenal name, which he assumed back in the 90s. Yes, that's not a joke he seriously did. And here on the cover, he's, well, even that's not technically... he. Yeah, that's basically his outfit, and... Fun fact, uh, in the origin of Wonder Girl story, they actually have her stop wearing this outfit and wear the outfit she's not wearing. If you see the Teen Titan Juice contract, they actually have her wear this particular attire. Yeah. It's the outfit that she would wear from this point forward up until like halfway through Marv Wolfman's run. Like during the original run of the Teen Titans. I think it was like issue 50, she becomes Troya. Let's see, 277, okay. Yeah, this is simply her alpha from this point forward, up until like the end of the si up until like the 90s, actually like the 2000s. You read this and, like some of the dialogue is like so sick, like saying words like check groovy. Yeah, it's the freaking 60s, so get used to it. Mm-hmm. Let's see. I'm almost to it. I don't think I passed today. Eh? Ah, uh, here we go. Yeah, this is. Let me show up the alpha she would wear. Like, if you for her look in, in New Teen Titans, yeah, this is a look she would sport in that particular run. Yeah, this alpha right here. And this is the alpha she wore from. Let's see. This came out in. I think it was like 1970, was it? This came out in 1969. That's when that's when this story was printed. This was the first origin story of Wonder Girl, where she ditched the original alpha that the, the artist who worked with Bob Haney on Brave Bowl 60. She ditched this alpha and basically went with this outfit here, which she would wear up until the I think it was like New Titans. Basically, when she became Troya, that's when she stopped wearing this outfit. And it's simply put. Her first, like, her second costume, actually, she's worn. She's worn a handful of costumes over the years. 
her most recent costume is like her or, or no or basically costume you see her wear like in stuff like Infinite Crisis, the whole black costume. Yeah, it's simply her old Troya costume without the uh, sleeves on it. Yeah, though for some reason they have her stop being called Troya. Yeah, I have no idea why DC did this for. Like, she has a code name. Her name is Troya, and yet they just call her simply Donna Troy. I mean, in the case of Roy Harper, they refer to him publicly as Roy Harper. Despite the fact in the original DC universe, his identity is publicly known for years, ever since the 1990s. Though when he was right out, he had become a secret again, though it was back being public knowledge. Currently, I don't know if his identity is public knowledge. Because that's a strange thing about the, the current universe. It's completely unknown who his identity is public knowledge. I think maybe the only one I can think of is maybe Ray Palmer. And that's basically it. Those He's the only one I can think of whose identity is public knowledge. I mean, Wally West isn't. Not in the current continuity. Nope. It was for pretty much the whole time he was the Flash. And... In the current con, in the well, because he came back in the current continent thanks to Titans Rebirth. Yeah, it's actually completely unknown if in fact his identity is publicly known or not. The only one I can think it probably is is probably Aquaman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this book also has a character. If we with this character only through the Teen Titans animated series. Let's see if I can find him here. Seventeen one thirty. Yeah. If you're only familiar with this guy, thanks to his appearance on the Teen Titans show, you're probably thinking, when did this guy first appear? This is not technically his first appearance, but look at this guy. It's the Mad Mod. Yep. In case you're wondering, despite the fact he's a, he's actually a, an ex-Teen Titans villain who fought in the comics, he only, he only appeared a few times in this run. After this, he disappeared. Did not return again until the 1990s. Thrown around by Chuck Dixon and Dan Jurgens. Where in that run, he became, he went, he had to understand in prison, he became a fashion designer, which, not a bad idea because he is from the 60s, though he looked like he has an age in the 60s. Yeah. But this is like pure classic for what it is. I give this book a 10 out of 10. It's something though, like, Neil Adams basically does a couple issues, and he's never returned Teen Titans. He never has. Dan Jerkins recently had returned to Teen Titans thanks to his miniseries Titans Burn a Rage, which was another issue came out today. He's come back to Batman many times and Superman and the X Men. I'm like, okay, he does all these great books. I appreciate that he comes back to Batman because he loves doing Batman. Why not come back for doing Teen Titans? It's a complete mystery. It's something of why he's never come back to Teen Titans. Uh, if I get a chance to meet him again, I'm going to ask him about that. Alright, moving on to a different DC book. We have. Suicide Squad, Katana, the C Curse of the Revenge of Cobra. Yeah, this is a sequel to her previous series, The Cult of Cobra from the Suicide Squad. I think it's this is from the Black Files. This is from the previous series, basically. Kind of like a Suicide Squad it, Most Wanted series. I haven't reviewed that yet, but this is technically her third series she's had. Though, I should point out that her outfit is... Well, we look at her outfit, you're probably thinking, is that the Baroness's costume she's wearing? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, if you look at her, the, her attire looks like an all-black suit, and with this with this mask that she's not wearing, she's worn this since her debut. Matter of fact, that's the only thing about her that wasn't changed to the current continuity, was her mask and her sword, though they did change, like, a little bit of backstory. Yes. This is done by her creator, one of her co-creators, Mike W. Burr. Yeah, I'd say one of her co-creators because Jim Perra can't do anything with this character because he's dead. He passed away in 2005. I've only talked to one person about Jim Perra, and that was Chuck Dixon. He was an awesome. I heard he was an awesome guy to work with, and he was also who designed the Troika costume that Batman wore from the mid 90s up until No Man's Land. Yeah, the, the costume that Batman wore. In the Tim Burton film that was brought into comics, that was all Jim Perro done the costume. In the case of this story here, it's pretty much a sequel to the, the Cold of Cobra, basically. Because here you have her basically on her own. This is basically a solo book for her. And before she joins up with the Outsiders, currently done by Brian Hill, which is really good. I'm looking forward to when the first trick comes out. I'm going to get my hands on it. Yep. There's a lot of stuff related to her, her story, backstory with her, her late husband, which they keep in here that her that her husband and her family was killed 
by her brother-in-law. Okay. It's kind of good, though, Mike Derber reestablished the fact that Katana had children. Because here's kind of the thing. If you read the current, if you read the recent Katana book, the ongoing series by by Anne Nesenti, there's no mention of her children at all. There's mention of her husband, which was implied in the book. What am I reading about? It was implied that she was the one who killed her husband, not the actual guy who they claimed to be the actual killer, which that was kind of stupid. Yeah, I probably will talk about that when I get a chance to talk about the Katana ongoing series, but and the same thing when I get hands in, hands in the trade. <laughs> but yeah, as for going off the Cobra, interesting idea. Cobra itself was not a creation of Mike W. Burr. Yeah, the organization of Believe or Not was the creation of the late Jack the King Kirby. That's not a joke. He seriously created this organization. In some ways, Cobra is kind of like Hydra. Though Hydra is not over is not overexposed as Hydra, but it's a very similar type of organization. Agents everywhere, though it has a snake motif with it. It's kind of like the Serpent Society of Marvel. But mostly it just basically DC's Hydra. Heck, they even wore green outfits. But the whole thing with, like, the Messiah stuff and the fact that the leader's name is Naja Naja. Yeah, it's like the, that Jack Kirby took elements of the Serpent Society and from Hydra, which he created, by the way, and basically made the Cobra. That's my personal theory how he created the organization Cobra. I don't know what the basis of this organization was, but that's just my personal theory on the matter. There's also going to space, which Cobra has gone to space in the Believe It Not, the Jones Directive. Yeah, which... That was a confusing story to read. Yeah, I'm thinking, though, like, why did John Ostrander, I think it was John Ostrander, and the other writers basically did the story. It's completely unknown of why they did the story for, but they did. It's one of the most bizarre stories I've ever read. But this is a lot better than John Ostrander. One thing is this is interesting. And basically, the character Halo, who was, who was another character created by... Mike Derry Burr, who's from the original Outsiders book, she is sort of in a way Katana's adopted daughter because she's a teenager. She's basically lived with her in her own apartment in, I think it's supposed to be, I don't think it's Gotham, is it, where she lives? She lives in, let's see, let's see if I can find, let's see, her apartment is in, because I know they have it here, it's in St. Rock, Louisiana. Yes, the same place where, during the Jeff Johns from Hawkman, that's where Hawkman and Hawk Girl lived, in St. Rock. There's no mention of Hawkman and Hawk Girl in here, but yes, that's where they lived, in Louisiana. My personal guess is the reason why they have Mike Burr had her, had her living here is because associated with the Suicide Squad. Though, since the end of the Suicide Squad book, but the book is coming back with Tim Seeley. But I can tell Katana is not part of that book because she's part of the outside of Batman and which is still really good. This book is just so good to read, and I highly recommend it if you're fans of Katana. Like, if you didn't like the Katana ongoing series and the Senti, this book, you would love this book. Plus the previous book, which I'll get, hopefully get a chance in my hands on that book in the future. Okay? Oh, what do I get this book? I get this book a 9.5 out of 10. There's also a very strange subplot in here where, get this, in this story, they have it where... The character Eve who was killed in the previous Katana story, which also introduced Geoforce to continuity. Yes, Geoforce. Yeah, I'm surprised he hasn't appeared in the current Outsiders book. I don't think... I know Katana's there, but Halo was not for some reason. I'll hopefully get a chance to book later on, sometime in the near future. I have to look up exactly when it's going to come out, but hopefully it comes out soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But overall, great book, okay? So, that's it for particular view. My next review will be a review of the newest episode of Case Close and then their comic corner, okay? This is the next view. Bye.